You know, I saw an article last night, and it was, it was from the American Bible Society. And it had some, some decent information in it, some, some encouraging things about people's attitudes toward the Bible. But it had something in it that was really not good at all. It said that 25% of people that are going to church on a regular basis, 25% of the people never hear the Bible actually read in the church. Can y'all believe that? That there are people going to church, 25% of the people going don't ever hear the scriptures read. That is so sad. We wonder what's going on with our country, our society, our culture, and our churches, and, and our youth and generations behind us. If they're not hearing the word, there's no way they're going to be changed and transformed. And you know, the, my authority, I have no authority as a, as a speaker. I mean, I could, I could just be a motivational speaker up here. What makes a difference in anything that I say is whether or not it comes from what, what the word is and what it says. This is the authority that we speak from. And this is the only real authority that we have for our lives. And so that's, we're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures today. So I want you to keep up with me. But it's, it's got a lot of good things uh, to say. And it, it might have to rethink the way we picture some things. Because we get pictures of our minds in the way things are supposed to be. Right? We, we picture things we... We get a sense of what we want, what it should be, what something should look like. Have you ever read, I know, Gene, I'm not talking about you. Have you ever read a book and, and you get a picture in your mind for the characters, the people, or the places, and then when they show you a picture or you go and see the movie and it doesn't look anything like what you had in your mind, right? You know, you know what that's like? Well, this we do that even now. We read even in the scriptures, and we have things pictured in our mind of how things are supposed to look. But when you actually read the scriptures, it says something different. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. But, you know, we realize, think about it like this. I'm going to show you some pictures. There are going to be pictures in this thing. When, whenever you start a new job, one of the things that you have to do is you have to find out if there's a dress code or a uniform that you're supposed to wear, right? Have you all ever had to wear a certain outfit, a certain clothes in order to have the job? So you can often tell where someone works based upon the uniform they wear. So where does this person work? McDonald's, okay. Where does this person work, if you can tell that? UPS, yeah, what can Brown do for you, right? Um, what about this guy? Where does he work? University of Tennessee, right? You can tell where he, who he plays for based upon the colors and, uh, and the, the style of his uniform. You can even tell what kind of work they do by, by the clothes that they wear. Can you, uh, well, what, what uh, branch of the military is this guy? He's in the Navy. And he's different from all of the other branches, right? Nobody else in their right mind would wear that, would they? You can also tell what, what kind of job does this person do? Their chef or cook of some kind? Uh, what about this guy? What does he do for a living? He does construction. This guy? He, the, the football player guy doesn't like him very much, right? And what about this guy? He, he, he's an engineer, right? He is the future of America sh and shipping and all that kind of stuff. So you can tell a lot by the kind of uniform that they wear. Now, have you ever thought or considered what kind of clothes that Jesus is wearing right now? Have you ever considered that? What, is, what does he look like? Is Jesus, is he going to be in a, in a business suit with a tie and all this other kind of stuff? Is he going to look like uh, a, a dignitary or foreign you know, official in today's world? See, sometimes that's the kind of picture that we create. Is he... He's not going to be dressed like a president. Is he not going to be dressed like a, a factory worker? You know, even the pictures that we put in our mind of the, the, the clothing, the robes, and all the stuff that he wears really aren't what he's looked at, what he'll be looked like. He'll be dressed with the role that he has been given and the role that he is fulfilling on our behalf. You know, Hebrews 7 talks about, 717 talks about Jesus, and it's quoting 
Psalm 110. And you'll see this when you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see this statement or these several, this passage referenced several times. He says, this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You'll see that in the early chapters of Hebrews. Hebrews, he says, then uh, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on your day of battle in holy splendor. From the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. That phrase that he talks about there in holy splendor is also talking about the kind of things that, they will, that those that come and follow him will be wearing. He says in verse 4, he says, The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. Forever you are a priest like who? Like Melchizedek. We, the scripture talks about him. He is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We talk about Jesus having three roles in the scripture. He is the prophet, he is the priest, and he is the prophet, priest, and king. He has those roles assigned to him in the scriptures. And this, this high priest, he is ruling as king. He has the iron scepter, and he is leading in battle and noticing that the people, we see this back here, your people are going to volunteer on your day of battle. See, the Lord is a warrior as well. He is the one who leads his people into battle. And so we will be going into battle with him. We will be signing up to get in behind him as he leads us into his day of battle. So he is going to battle in his role as priest. That's consistent with what we see elsewhere in the Old Testament. See, many times it's the priest who led the nation into battle. Many times it was them who were in the front. They would lead the nation wherever they went. The priest would carry the Ark of the Covenant out in front of the people. We see that in Joshua chapter 3. He says, when the people, this is where they're crossing the Jordan River. They're going into enemy territory, but it's also they're going into the promised it says, when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. So they went in first. And what happened? As soon as the priests and their, their feet touched the edges of the water, what happened to the Jordan River? That's where it separated. That's where they were able to go through the Jordan River, much like they went through the Red Sea. They went in on dry ground. In fact, they were able to gather they were told to go back out into the river, 12 people to go out and gather stone from the, from the bedrock of the river and come out and bring them out and set them up as a memorial. 12 stones, one stone for each tribe. You'll see that kind of is a recurring picture. Numbers chapter 31 says this, So Moses spoke to the people, Equip some of your men for war. And he gives a few things here from where they're coming from. But verse 6 says, Moses sent 1,000 from each tribe to war. They went with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, in whose care were the holy objects and the signal trumpet. So who's in charge of leading this people into battle? Phinehas is, the, the, the son of Eleazar, the priest. He is the one who is leading everybody in there. You see another example, and I'm going to use this Phrase from Second Chronicles, uh, well, he's Second Chronicles chapter twenty. This is out of the the New American Standard. I actually like this one a little bit better because it has something neat in it. But it's in the, this is in the days of Jehoshaphat. He says, when in the morning they got up early and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, as they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, "Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe." in Yahweh your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. When they had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. That phrase there is the important one. Those who praise him in holy attire. Come on now. As they went out before the army, and they said, so they're, the ones in the holy attire are going out before the army 
He said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. So who wears the holy attire in the scriptures? The priests do. They are the ones leading them into battle. The priests are leading into battle. That's consistent even with what we read about in, in Revelation chapter 19 where we see our, our great high priest coming in glory. He says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war not the way the world does. He does it in righteousness. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He, he had a name written there that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. Now this is where it gets a little interesting. It says the armies that were in heaven followed him. We read about this earlier. These are the people of God who are volunteered to go with him. They also were on white horses wearing pure white linen. That's an important feature because it tells us about something that we're going to be wearing and the kind of people that we're going to be and the roles that we're going to have. Because what kind of people, what kind of nation is he making us into? He's making us into a kingdom of priests, is he not? Because a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the kind of picture that, is pict that we see Jesus is doing. This is what he is, the role that he is fulfilling even in our future. He is leading a battle. And so when we think of somebody that's leading a battle, we typically picture them in, in different kinds of armor, different types of combat uniform type of thing, right? And when we think about the armor of God, don't we usually have a picture like this of what the armor of God would look like? But he's, we look at that kind of armor and we see that he's, you know, this is, this is more of a Roman military type of armor. But what kind of enemy do you think this guy is going to go up against? What's the nature of his enemy? It's something very physical. I mean, he's got a sword, he's got a shield. It's going to be somebody that had better be in front of him, right? It's a, it's a physical thing that he's going to go blow to blow with. Okay, That's the kind of armor that this represents, but does that match the enemy that we have according to Scripture? Is this our true enemy? No, because you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is in that passage about the armor of God. He says, for our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical blow for blow kind of battle that we think of the way we wage war. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. That's the kind of battle, that's the kind of enemy that we are fighting. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says it like this. He says, for though we live in the body, we do not wage war the way the world does, or in an unspiritual way. Even though we are physical, our battleground is still not on this level. Since the weapons of our warfare are not war. The weapons of our warfare are not the same kind that you see the, the United States military using, or the, the Roman military using, or anything like that. Those are not our weapons. Now, even though that's what we've got a picture in our mind, that's not the kind of weaponry that Scripture wants us to have. He says our weapons instead are powerful 
through God for the demolition of those kind of strongholds. We demol demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. The kind of things that prevent people from seeing the truth. That's what our greatest, that's where our fight is against. Taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Ephesians 6, 11 says like this, you know, when we talk about putting on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. That's our enemy. That's who we're fighting at. We're going against not just what the world wants to throw at us. He, we're going at the deception and the lies and all of the things that, that he is throwing at us. That is our enemy. It's not even the flesh and blood person that's right in front of us. Even if we are in physical combat, is that person really the enemy? No. The enemy is the, the deception that has so maybe enraged them to where they would come after us or so uh, deceived them into addictions or something else like that. They are still a person that needs to hear the good news to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you look at the armor that he provides for us to fight with, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, Stand, therefore, with the truth like a belt around your waist. The truth is the belt. Righteousness like armor on your chest. And your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. Peace primarily is peace with God. It says, in every situation, take the shield of faith. And with it, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. He says, then uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. Now, if you picture the armor like this, you've got the wrong enemy in mind. You're working for the U.S. Postal Service when you're wearing a UPS uniform, or you're going to show up to fight in the Army in your naval whites. You've got the wrong uniform. See, Satan wants us picturing our battle like this. Satan wants us wearing this kind of armor, fighting each other and not really fighting our true enemy. We need to change and transform even the way we think about these things because the enemy that we fight is not worldly, but it is spiritual, and we fight in prayer. It is a spiritual battle. That's why that passage in Ephesians goes on right after talking about the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. He says, pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert. You know, be on guard. Don't let your watch let down. With all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Y'all realize what that says? You know, it says pray at all times in the Spirit. Y'all realize you can pray and not be in the Spirit? You can be praying and just run in your mouth. We've got to understand that prayer is the battleground. We've got to understand that we are going to war on a spiritual level when we enter into that time of prayer. See, God, we, he is talking about armor. You know, Paul is writing this when the Romans were invading the land and have taken over and they were an enemy to the Jewish people. Do you think... Paul would really use the picture of the, the foreign invading army troops to communicate the truth of God. See, he would not use the, the, the armaments of the enemy to say, oh, this is the way we should do it. See, God was already talking about armor long before the Roman Empire ever existed. Those who intercede for God's people need an armor to fight the real enemy, the enemy, and fight the battle for our freedom, for our redemption. We see this in Isaiah chapter 59. He says, He saw that there was 
No man. He was amazed. There was no one interceding. So his own arm brought salvation. And who is he talking about? His own arm brought salvation. Who is he talking about here? Who does that? Yeah, Jesus, the Messiah does. And when you think about it, his own arm brought salvation. What's that word salvation in Hebrew? I've told you this before. I want to make sure you remember it. Yeah, the word salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. So his own arm brought Yeshua. And his own righteousness supported him. And here's the kicker. Here's verse 17. He put on righteousness like what? Like a breastplate. Now, where have I heard that talk about a breastplate of righteousness before? That's the Ephesians 6 passage. See, when Paul is thinking about the breastplate of righteousness, he's going back, not to the Romans, he's going back to the Scriptures. And he says, a helmet of salvation on his head. Wait a minute, where have we read that about the helmet of salvation? Wasn't that also mentioned in Ephesians 6? So again, he's referring back to this kind of stuff. He's referring back to the picture that the scriptures portray of that armor. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. So what does Jesus' armor, what does it look like? And you think about it, what does ours look like? See, the only armor fitting for our high priest is the robes that the high priest uh, wore as outlined in the scriptures. Can you imagine Jesus showing up to serve as, as our high priest in the robes of, of a priest to another god, like the priest of Zeus, some other temple? Could, would Jesus ever show up in a uniform that was to another god? No. He never, ever would do that. So why do we picture the armor of God in such a pagan way? even in our minds. See, all of the elements of the armor of God in Ephesians 6 are really, they are pictured within the high priest's robes. And it was in the readings from the bulletin from last week in Exodus chapter 28, where we're reading about these things. These are the kind of robes, the one on, the, on your right, the blue, those are the high priest's robes. Exodus 28, verse 2 says this. He says, Make holy garments for your brother Aaron for glory and for beauty. You are to instruct all the skilled craftsmen whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom to make Aaron's garments for consecrating him to serve me as priest. Now, so we see some of the things in it. It's like this, he is doing this for glory. Now, whose glory is he talking about? Is that so Aaron can look good? No, it's not for his glory. It's not for his beauty because this is representing God's glory. It's representing his beauty. To set him apart. They were craftsmen filled with the spirit of wisdom. So even the Holy Spirit was at work in, in helping these craftsmen make these clothes. And it was to set him apart. So he would look different from everybody else. So wherever he is, you'd be able to recognize this is the high priest. Whenever he comes along, you will, there, will not be, uh, there will not be anybody else that looks like him. So you will recognize the high priest when he comes. And there won't be any imposters. There won't be anybody, any uh, people that, that you mistake for him. When he comes along, you'll know who he is. So it goes on, he says, these are the garments that they must make. Now listen to this and compare it, keep in mind Ephesians 6. He says, a breast piece and, and an ephod, which is like your a robe or uh, a cloak around it, uh, a robe, a specially woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that they may serve me as priests. So he's giving instructions not just for the high priest, but also the other priests as well. They should use gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen. So when you think about things, 
the breastpiece, the breastplate of righteousness. This is what a close-up of what it would be. It's that piece that sets right here. It's fastened with cords and different other things on him. But it says, when he's describing it, in verse 17, it says, Place a setting of gemstones on it, four rows of stones. The first row should be a row of, and your different translations will have maybe different types of stones in all of this. But he says, uh, uh, carnelian, topaz, and emerald. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They should be adorned with gold filigree in their setting. What do all of those stones represent? Each one of those stones has the name of one of the tribes written on it. So it represents the people. It's that, and that's what the, it's, it's reminding them that this is over the heart. See, the 12 stones are to correspond to the names of Israel's sons. Each stone must be engraved like a seal with one of the names of the 12 tribes. So again, when it says he put on righteousness like a breastplate, this is the picture that comes to mind. The righteousness covers our heart. It's no longer is, you know, our heart. We scripture talks about our heart being deceitfully wicked. But it has been covered not by our own righteousness, but by someone else's righteousness. It's been overlaid over our heart. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's been changed. The righteousness of Jesus the Messiah has been given to us to cover over and protect and guard our sinful hearts. It's the righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Then we think about the the helmet of salvation. This one's a little harder to see. You know, it's like the the turban that it talks about on top of his head, Isaiah 59. Whoops, that's Gabriel walking around last last year at the at the um, Jerusalem marketplace. the The messianic rabbi from Knoxville came and he brought us uh, a homemade uh, high priest outfit, and uh, that thing was it was very hot. Yeah, well. I wasn't going to say that. Uh, but he said, he says it's the helmet of salvation on his head. And I, I couldn't find a really good picture of it. But it's that, it's that turban picture that the, it's describing in the high priest's uniform. And this is how he describes it. He says, you are to make a pure gold medallion and engrave it like an engraving of a seal that says, holy to the Lord, set apart to the Lord. Fasten it to a cord of blue yarn so that it can be placed on the turban. The medallion is to be on the front of the turban. So we sing about this from time to time on, you know, crown him with many crowns. We, we sing, bring forth the royal diadem and do what? Crown him. Put it on him. We, or the picture even of a crown that we typically use is not the kind of crown that they would have ever used in Scripture. It's that, it's that picture of the turban being on there. Our hearts must be covered, and so must our minds. Our thoughts must be redeemed and saved as well. And remember, the, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. So in reality, this helmet is the helmet of, it's called the helmet of salvation. And since the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, whose, whose helmet really does it belong to? It's the helmet of Yeshua that covers over our head, who is our salvation, and it has his name written on it. It has that name. It says, Holy to the Lord. That's also his name, isn't it? So just like Revelation says, when you read in the early chapters and some of the other ones, he's going to write his name where? on us he's going to write his name across our forehead see the whole stuff about the mark of the beast being on your forehead or on your right hand he's copying he's copycatting what God is really going to do 
He's going to put His name holy to the Lord. He's going to put that across our heads, across our foreheads. That we, signifying that we belong to Him, that we are in service to Him, that we ourselves have been made holy and set apart to the Lord. So our hearts, our minds, have got to be protected and re-identified with His people and His name. And so when we talk about the, the sash, what it talks about being a sash, we call that in Ephesians, he calls that the belt of truth. The belt of truth, it's, that's what holds everything together. You know, the pieces of the high priest's garments, they're going to ca- connect, they're going to tie off on the belt of truth. It says, fasten it. It's harder to see it in that picture. You can maybe see it a little bit here in, in Gabriel. There's that, that one piece that's kind of dangling down uh, off to the side where it's tied off. It's to hold everything and keep it fitted and in place. But it's also where it's tied off on. The, all of the pieces of the high priest's garments connect to the truth, to the sash, to the belt. And truth is what holds our faith together. Truth is what holds our faith together. If it's not true, is it really worth believing? If what the scripture says did not really happen the way it says it happened, is it worth, is it trustworthy? See, truth is what holds everything together. Truth is how we confront the enemy because he is known not as the father of the truth. The enemy is known as the father of lies. So truth is what holds all that we believe together because that's what helps us confront the enemy. And then we talk about feet being fitted with the gospel of peace. You know, when you talk about the high priest, when they're serving in the temple, they're barefoot. They don't wear shoes at all. And it doesn't matter how hot the stones get. It doesn't matter how cold the stones get. They're not, they don't wear any shoes because just like what they had in the burning bush experience, what did God tell them when Moses was before the burning bush? Take off your what? Your sandals, your shoes, because the place where you are standing is set apart. It's holy ground. Okay? So they go around without any shoes while they're serving there in the temple. But we also see... Um, I think I'm skipping one here. Yeah, I'm, I got one out of order. Oh, I'll read this to you here. Uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaims peace, who brings good th- news of good things, who proclaims salvation, who proclaims Yeshua, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So that's that feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel. While we are in God's presence, we don't need the shoes. But when we go with the message out into the world, what do we need? We need the shoes on. Okay. So if we're going out from his presence to fulfill the mission and the purpose, we've got to bring the gospel of peace. That's what we carry with us everywhere we go. They're taking that message with them. Then we talk about the shield of faith. You know, that picture of the the Roman um, armor, he's got that shield that kind of covers him right here. You know what? That shield is way too small. When there are swords and arrows and everything flying around out there in the world, you know, I want a shield that's bigger than what I can carry. Wouldn't you? And see, that's the kind of shield that we picture. But the shield of faith is bigger than one you can carry because who really is our shield? God is, isn't he? God is our shield and our fortress, our refuge in times of trouble. He goes before us. He is our rear guard. He says, This is Psalm 3. It says, Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me, many who say about me, there is no help for him in God. 
We sing a song that has these lines in it. And he says, but you, O Lord, thou, O Lord, are a shield. Where? Is it just in front of me? Is it just beside me? Next to me? No, it is around me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head, the one who gives me hope. Psalm 84 says it like this, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. It's, it's, almost, it's like a blinding protection. And it is all-encompassing, all front, back, top, and bottom. Any of you sci-fi fans out there, you know what the Starship Enterprise is? Y'all know what that is? Would it make sense for them to only have shields on the front? No, they have shields that protect the ship that goes all the way around. And these, this shield is to, to extinguish. It puts out all the fiery darts of the evil one. Everything that he sends our way, this shield is to protect us. We are totally surrounded by God, his presence, and he is our shield. Now, when we picture the next one, the sword of the spirit, we, ought, we again, we carry that picture of it uh, of a, a literal weapon, but what is it really? It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the Word of God. I, I like this picture better because he's, as he's re- the, the outline of the sword, if you can see it more closely, but he's really reaching for the Scriptures. See, the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. The Word is actually better than a sword that you can carry. You don't fight the world's battles with a sword. You fight them with the scriptures. You fight the spiritual enemies. Uh, even a, you know, even a, a literal sword, it takes time to master the fighting with a, a literal sword. I actually just saw a news report the other day of, a, of an actor over in Asia or Japan or something like that practicing with a, a stage prop sword. And he tripped and he fell. And guess what happened? That sword killed him, even though it was fake. The sword that we have, it takes practice. It, we, it takes time to learn how to wield this sword. But we have to wield it. We have to master this sword because when the temptations come our way, how did Jesus fight off the temptations? How did he deflect them? Did he have a literal sword to fight the devil? And he came with him as the temptations? No, he fought him off with the sword of the Spirit. He fought him off with the word of God. So, you know, what's, again, all of that armor that we picture in Ephesians 6 is really picturing back to this armor of the priest. We have to look at what the priest was wearing as a type of armor. So, you know, what's the point? Why do we need to talk about this? The, all of this imagery and language, again, is consistent with the Old Testament. And sometimes it's hard to see how we have blended our understanding of the scriptures with with, uh, the the pagan Greek or Roman type of picture. Sometimes it's hard for us to pick that out. All that he provides for us is patterned after what we see in the Old Testament, just like we looked at last week with the tabernacle. But the real reason why... You know, we have, this, we have this picture. These are pictures that you see of the second coming. It talks about being a robe dipped in blood. And even this picture tries to portray that the whole robe is red. That it's really, that's the picture of the consecration of the robe. The robe is described as being blue. Even little things, the way we picture it. See, I want you to be able to recognize your boss your Lord, when he's in uniform and when he shows up. You need to be able to recognize who your king and who the commander of your army really is. Who are you signing up to fight behind? Who are you volunteering to follow into battle? Because in the last days, Scripture has promised, it says, in the last days, how many people are going to be showing up claiming to be the Messiah? One or two? One or two? Just a few? There's going to be many. There's going to be many who claim to be the Messiah. 
but they won't have the right appearance. They won't have the right truth. They, they, you will be able to recognize them because they will be out of unison. You're supposed to be able to recognize your true king, your true high priest, even when in the midst of the great delusion that is coming upon the world. And see, when you've got that picture, you, you go back to that statement in Revelation chapter 19. He says, your rider is coming on the white horse, and all of those riders are riding in behind them. Right? What, what kind of clothes or tunics are they wearing? They're wearing the white tunic. Right? The ones over here on the left side. The high priest gets the, the fancy clothes and the blue and all that stuff. The, the other priests have the white tunic. That's all from the Old Testament scripture. The ones that are riding in and following behind the Messiah are we who are serving as the kingdom of priests and the holy nation. We need to know the uniform of our king and our leader. And, you know, sometimes it's just nice to know what am I going to wear tomorrow. You know, y'all. sometimes y'all ever have a hard time picking out what you're going to wear the next day? Yeah. Well, there you go. That's what you're going to be wearing in the future. And it's going to fit really well, so you don't have to worry about it tripping over it. He is going to provide everything for us. When you show up to, as service in the kingdom of God, he provides even what you're going to wear. He will hold your life together with truth. He will cover your sinful heart with his righteousness. You will be a blessing everywhere your feet go when they bring the gospel. God will be your shield, and on all sides, despite all the attacks of the enemy, he will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus as the new name is written on your forehead, and he will give you the most effective weapon to protect, fend off, and fight the enemy. That's the living and active word of God. All of this he is providing for us. We also, also need to realize why, what's the point of all this. You know, when Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 22, about the wedding feast. And you know somebody tries to show up at the wedding that doesn't have the wedding clothes on? Y'all remember that? Somebody shows up not in uniform, not with their hearts being covered, not with the helmet of salvation, not with all of the things that he provides for them. And what happens to him? When he tries to show up without the clothes that is provided by the bridegroom. He's thrown out. He's not allowed to stay. See, if you try to pick your own clothes to stand before Jesus, you'll get thrown out of his presence. See, this, that all, we need to know what we're going to wear. We need to know what kind of armor he's giving us. We need to know how to recognize our king against all of the delusions that are coming our way and that comes in our trusting in him that comes in our receiving by faith the salvation that he is so readily and willing to give he's willing to provide everything for you so that you will volunteer to follow behind him in his army it's it's not a draft it's not mandatory you sign up by choice, and you take what he gives you. See, in Christ, we are that kingdom of priests. He gives us the armor to wear. He gives us the clothes to wear. He supplies what we need to be following and serving behind our great high priest in the battle. And as we sing, we, you, we ask that question. We've asked that question as we've sung it many times. It's, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you what? What's the next line? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 